All right, so uh, the second part of uh, chapter 5 talks about uh, a little bit of evolution. And this really is uh, just an introduction. So I'm having trouble getting uh, to switch into... There we go. This is just an introduction. You could have an entire uh, semester uh, based on this stuff. So we've got one part of one chapter. So here's a lovely, horrible textbook definition here for us. Uh, cumulative genetic changes that occur over time in a population of organisms. Cumulative genetic changes, accumulation, and accumulation of all the genetic changes that occur in a population of organisms. Word is a little smoother. And hopefully we're going to answer you know, as we go through this conversation, um, why those happen. And if it doesn't have a slide, I may interject here and there. Okay, there is just randomness, there is just mutation. Okay, but sometimes, like we just spent the last half hour talking about, there's external reasons as well. Uh, evolution, everybody, you know, first word that comes to mind is if you had to play Jeopardy or whatever. Uh, give me one name that's associated with evolution. Everyone's going to say what? Darwin. Yeah. All right. Um, and he certainly was a big name there. He was by no means uh, correct. There's a lot of stuff that he got sort of wrong. There's some stuff he got sort of right. There's some stuff he got sort of wrong. And and that's why when people want to start arguing about evolution. And they start saying, well, Darwin, 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 we're like, yeah, we know. We don't have anything like that. Move on. Read some of the new guys and then come argue with them. Um, it didn't start with Darwin either. It goes all the way back to Aristotle and, and probably before him. They just didn't write it down. If you're paying attention, you realize that things change, that organisms change. All right? And we've been paying attention for a while. We realize that things change. And there's a couple levels of, of evolution as well. There's, there's micro, there's, there's macro, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, micro is change within a particular type of organism. All right, and macro is change from one to a, another. Usually that's the one people have problems with, the macro. I don't believe we agree things can change on any basis in the common social. Micro, everybody pretty much believes, and they at least believe in science. Um, flu shot is a great example of it. Okay. Um, if you get the same flu shot every year, no, why not? Because the flu changes. Yeah, the flu changes. You don't even have to use that evil E word, right? It changes every year. It's a different flu. Why? Because it's evolving in the background. It's changing. You can't get a flu shot from five years ago and expect it to work. So, and, and pretty much everybody goes, oh, yeah, I understand. So you're accepting evolution there. But I don't understand the bigger effect. I do. I do. Some of us are like, want a big ass, as they say. But I think we're going to be on the smaller level of things today, and again, we're going to talk about it in regard to um, pressures within the ecosystem and stuff like that. Okay? Again, where it's it's pretty easy, at least, to nod, nod along with me. If you don't necessarily agree, you're like, hey, I can see that, I guess. So, so bear with me. This is a can be a touchy subject with a lot of folks. And um, we'll, we'll go through it. Another definition that I never really saw much point in, but it, it keeps showing up in the, in the books, Continuous unidirectional change. One directional change. I don't know why they need to point that, that out. Let me see what this, again, smile and nod at it. Um, I told you a moment ago there are two kinds of evolution, micro and macro. Before that, there are 
two kinds of evolution. There's organic and there's physical. Um, organic evolution obviously refers to, to life. And that's the micro-macro one. Again, as I said, I always think of critters. Okay, um, my bad. And I'm a geologist as well. I should, of course, know about the, the bottom one. Yeah, I do. I just can't even think about that. Changes in the on the Earth itself. Changes in the environment. Um, you guys probably haven't been alive long enough yet to notice this, but you will find over time that an area you knew around your town, your hometown, or a favorite place you like to go um, will change over the years. Maybe when you were a little kid, it was a field. Uh, but as you get older and maybe you bring your kids back there, you realize that, holy cow, there's a whole lot more trees here than, than I remember. Okay, it's starting to grow into a forest. Or maybe it goes the other way for some reason or another, and the area becomes a, a whole lot wetter. You're certainly not going to start to grow trees there. You're going to say, boy, this place is a lot marshier than I remember it. Or in and, this case, an area who knows we can develop it. Or there's a shopping mall here. Oh, yeah. boy, that's not a field. Yeah, I don't remember blacktop here. Exactly. Um, again, humans are out of the picture, though, so we don't want to, we don't want to throw the shopping mall example in there. It's, it's certainly something we do. Don't get me wrong. But the Earth on her own, doing her thing, okay, Environments change. That's physical evolution, and again, something nobody argues with. We, we see it; it's it's evident, and it doesn't really threaten our religious background. Um, the organic one is is the touchy one sometimes. I like this definition personally: uh, origin of and or change of groups of organisms through time. I think that's a sweet definition of, of organic or biological evolution. And then, of course, origin of and or changes in environments through time. So we can use the same definition, just substitute organisms and environments. I think that's a lot simpler, and not just simple, but straightforward, plain, understandable. So organisms can change, and new organisms can appear. And as you know, new organisms, or not new organisms, organisms can disappear. What do we call when an organism disappears? Extinction, yeah. And the opposite of extinction, I dropped the word earlier, is speciation, okay? The arrival of a new species, the origin of a new species called speciation. So extinction and speciation, two opposite ends there. All right, so I mentioned this already, micro and macro. Again, some science talk here, gene frequency, you know. happens in a single population and it happens in a short period of time. You can do a couple of things with this. You can talk about um, hair color, you can talk about eye color, okay? Um, you guys all remember whether you enjoyed it or not, or did great with it or not, you remember the Gregory Mendel, the peapods with the uh, hundred, what, 100 squares, right? And you had your the little names just jumped out of my head. Uh, the, the dominant and the recessive trait, capital letter, lowercase letter, and you mix with the numeral like that. Okay. So that's as most basic. Just think of that when you see gene frequency. Okay. Um, but let's just say that um, you live in an area where there's a whole lot of brown haired people. They look around this classroom. Most everybody in here has got brown haired or black is there. We got a few blonde folks in here, um, whether by nature or by choice. So there's you know, traditions that have to just go by nature. And um, and it seems like pretty simple the brown heads and the, the black heads. Um, you know, your hair color is your choice. 
but let's just throw into this mix now that a whole bunch of um, blonde-headed people moved into an area where they just haven't been before. Uh, let's assume that they're accepted by their local population, and over the years, they intermingle. And what do we think we're going to see over time? More blonde-headed people or less blonde-headed people in the population? Even the dominant recession aside, don't think too deep about this. What are we going to see? More blonde, okay? Because it's just that much more genetic material in the pool to make more blonde headed people. You say the same thing about curly hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, any genetic trait you want to think of. I, it's, 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 at a Sesame Street level, it's, it's that simple. Okay, nothing's ever that simple, but it's, you know, Elmo talking to you, kind of where I try to keep stuff. It's that simple, all right? Um, and that can happen rather quickly. Uh, in, biologically speaking, a couple generations is quickly, all right? That's going from, let's say, your great-grandparents up to you. If you go antiquing, uh, I know that's what all college students love to do, but, you know, if you go antiquing and you go look at old furniture, tables used to be a hell of a lot shorter. People were shorter. Just a hundred years ago, we try to sit under these same things now. Desks, okay? Like, what is this? A kids' desk? No, it was a kitchen table. You know, well, a kids' table. No, it's a kitchen table. We've gotten taller in, in just a hundred years. The average height has grown, probably due to nutrition, who knows? But nonetheless, you know, it's, it's a decent example of, of how this thing can work. So, relatively short periods of time. That's micro. And we're talking about a specific thing changing. Macro is a descent of a different species. Okay, this is the big, the big one here. This takes a large amount of time. Because what happens is all those little things, hair color, eye color, whether you're nocturnal or diurnal, uh, we have a whole population that grows up having to work the night shift forever. Okay, and um, then all this, you know, they're not gonna probably mix and mingle with folks that work the day shift. And just all these weird little things add up. I'm trying to think of some non-biological effect here, so that's gonna come up with night shift and day shift. All right, all these things add up over large periods of time. And eventually you could end up with two populations that just don't mix and mingle. Now, the not having viable offspring, that's a hard one, especially because I'm kind of using human examples here. All right? Whether or not you've got blonde hair and blue eyes or blonde hair and brown eyes and you work the night shift, that doesn't mean that you can't produce viable offspring with some opposite version of that. Okay? But I'm trying to give you guys sort of simple, easy way to, to process things. But trust me on this point, I don't say that very often. Just gotta trust me that in nature, all right, this does happen, and that you, these things can build up to the point where you have a, a new type of species. Otherwise, it's gonna critter, but it no longer can reproduce. That's the weirdest part for me too, understanding how that. Don't worry about this list so much, but it is again, there's so many more people out there than, than Darwin. Okay? And you gotta go all the way back to, to Aristotle and, and then then some. You guys might have heard of Lamarck in school, in biology class. Lamarck was the giraffe guy. He said that if giraffe keeps stretching their necks for weeks, the higher the higher leaves, that they'd eventually, you know, pass on that characteristic to uh, baby giraffes. That's the kind of you know thinking. And nowadays you know it's much easier to, to process, but um, you know, that if you go to go, uh, to uh, Planet Fitness, you know, six times a week, and you end up dating someone and marrying someone and having babies with someone who also goes to Planet Fitness six times a week, that your baby's going to be super buff. It's not a thing, right? You don't even expect it to be. But that's what Lamarck put forward. Um, there's also some folks out there trying to give Lamarck some credit. Um, 
I, I read a paper once. It wasn't entitled Lamar Scott of Raphael, but it sort of was. Um, he wrote it in French, which is a sign that everyone was writing in Latin. Um, but he wrote it in French, not a whole lot of people were able to fully get what he was saying. And there's a lot of folks that are going back and looking at the original work and saying, well, that wasn't exactly what he meant. He was using that as an example, but a lot of his other stuff was on target. Because he was a smart guy. It wasn't just, you know, he decided to write a paper one day about that. He had his whole body of, you know, stuff behind him. He was really good at it. So he wasn't a dodo. But, um, so you're trying to get better through the doubt, turn it into a different angle and so on and so forth. So, you know, not necessarily the, the guy we all learn about in our ninth grade textbooks, but nonetheless. At Gould and Elridge, I told you about Stephen J. Gould. His, um, his advisor was Niles Eldridge, um, who, you know, talk about geeking out sort of thing. A couple times I had to go to the uh, Natural History Museum in Manhattan. I kind of like hoped I'd bump into him in the hallway kind of thing. Um, he was like 90 and still going to work every day. This was 20 years ago. I think Niles Eldridge is dead now, probably. But, um, but yeah, he's like the godfather of evolution and paleontology. He's modern, at any rate. So I guess we're going to talk about these guys a little bit in their contributions. Uh, Buffon, I think is how we would say this. So going back to 17, something he probably didn't do when he was a baby, so let's go to the mid-17s. Okay. All forms of life have evolved from other forms. Did he use the word evolve? Maybe, maybe not. But came from, okay, would be a good word. All forms of life have come from other forms. Ah, uh, this is the good important part. This is why we've been talking about it in this class. The environment plays an important role in an organism's development and its existence. He also acknowledged changes in an organism due to inheritance of characteristics from parents. We know that, generally. Every so often you'll get that odd duck of a child that doesn't look like anybody. Um, but it happens. But generally speaking, kids look like their parents. And then he gave us the idea of a species. He gave us the idea of a species. And again, I will put these up for you, so you're not getting all the little uh, bullet points. They're raindrops. How nice. You're not getting all the raindrops. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. All right. A little after Buffon. He coined the term biology. See, I told you he was a smart guy. He did stuff. Um, and the idea that plants and animals are interrelated. Cooperation. He may not have used the word symbiosis and stuff like that, but the idea of this ecosystem. You can't just have plants living without animals. You can't just have animals living without plants. Uh, the environment, again, putting forward, you probably read the thought, okay? Um, changes in the environment cause change in an organism's behavior. And then altered behavior leads to greater or lesser use of a given structure, causing it to increase. Yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. So here's the part that wasn't so right. And they've all got something. Okay, they've all got something um, that, 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 again, like I said, Darwin, he was not on target 100% either. Okay, and then you guys got something. Um, how many of you? Had your appendix taken out? Wow. Nobody? Mine didn't come out until I was 30. It was the second year I was teaching here. Third year I was teaching here. So it's called the stygial structure. All right? It's something we don't need anymore. It's a little branch. It's an offshoot of small intestine or large intestine. I forget exactly where it lives. But it's a little nook off to the side. And every so often it gets clogged up because it is just a little cavity off to the side and the stuff gets in it and it traps some gunk in there. It starts to fester and, and it goes that. And they don't take it out of you in case because sometimes it doesn't happen. I'm surprised no one's had their appendix out there. Um, 
they think, we're not sure why it's there, it seems to have no purpose. Um, they've gone in and they've gotten some cells from it and so on and so forth, but they... There you go. Thank you. Um, you worded it much better than I would have. So positive gut bacteria. It's, it, it's, it serves right now as a breeding ground. Whether that was intentional or not, but that's certainly the purpose that it serves now. All right. Uh, you've heard probiotics, right? If you go out, you ever have a bad stomach day, or you take a, a, antibiotics for too long, or try to eat some yogurt. Okay. Well, this is a natural version of that. They feel originally, okay, that it was there to aid in, it was bigger, probably a little longer, and it helped us extra digest because we ate more food that needed more processing, so to speak. We ate more nuts and berries and stuff like that, um, meats and whatnot. So it was there because we needed um, the extra digestible stuff, and, and probably even that it provided more um, enzymes and bacteria and whatnot. But regardless, now, kind of because it is out of the way, um, it serves as a wonderful natural breeding ground for that. So, um, you know, this this bottom bullet here, the point being, all right, if you, if you lend itself to the giraffes, yeah, no, not so much. But if you talk about your appendix, well, okay, maybe that makes sense. So. And that those are inheritable. So he's talking about stuff in a single generation, potentially, all right? In a single generation, disuse or increased use, and then that, 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 that was inheritable. And that's where we just have to say, no, sorry, man. Only because they're better at explaining to them when they get into third grade, I would say. But I don't know. You know, that that's possible, but I think, again, that would be nurture instead of nature. But, again, what he did sort of get at was this continual, gradual change toward a point, okay? And that is important. That is something we uh, believe in, if you would. All right, Mr. Darwin. Uh, on the origin of species, you've heard that before. You heard he was on a boat for a very long time. He was actually there as a cartographer, I think. He was supposed to be making maps, but um, while he was there, he started looking at the critters. I get bored of making maps too, I suppose. And <coughs> he started paying attention to the critters and collecting samples. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, populations evolve over generations through a process of natural selection. All right, natural selection, you've heard of that. And again, uh, potentially why we're discussing it in this chapter. Okay. Uh, descent with modification, that's a little more wordy. But the idea is um, when they say descent, they mean future generations. Okay. That's what descent with modification is. More so, he was the first person to provide a mechanism, all right? And if anything, um, that's what he should be uh, remembered for. Other people just theorized that it was there and said this is probably how it works. But he gave a, a more detailed mechanism. It's kind of like the plate tectonics thing. You guys heard about plate tectonics. The continents move around and so on and so forth. And the first guy to uh, go to a conference and present that uh, idea, Alfred Wegener, um, 
practically got laughed off the stage. He went to, uh, he had the unfortunate thing of preventing it at a, presenting it at a geophysicist's thing. So you got all these physicists saying, okay, continents are sliding around the planet. How the hell is that happening now? What's going on here? He didn't have a mechanism. He knew. He was damn sure it was happening. Okay. But he didn't have a way for it to happen, so it wasn't really accepted. And it wasn't until years later, he unfortunately was long gone, um, that they think now, they think they know how it's happening. But again, we accept it. We've got GPSs. We know that North America and Europe are moving farther apart. We know that um, uh, the Himalayas are growing higher uh, every moment of every day. You know, we undeniable. Plate tectonics is. So we've kind of backed off on the, I don't believe you because you don't have a way. All right. Um, but back then, going back to evolution here, you know, there was pressure to say, okay, you guys are saying all this stuff. How's it happening? Give me a way. Give me a reason. So he was one of the first to come forward um, with that idea. And it's a fairly simple idea. Those organisms that are better adapted are more than likely to thrive and live. The common sense now, right? The more comfortable you are in your environment, the better you're going to probably do. And again, we could think of that as humans. It's pretty straightforward. But the same could be said for the green anole. It could be said for the red squirrel. It could be said for the moss growing out there. So these don't have to be huge brain-breaking ideas. Uh, in, in geology, we have a handful of these principles that, that govern how we say how old something is, okay? And I call them, well, duh, moments. Because when you say it, you're like, well, yeah, okay. But somebody has to say that simple thing applies to this situation before everyone else is like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So in retrospect, it's simple and silly. But on day one, you're like, oh, my God, how did I not see that? You know? So to say something like this, 150 years later, whatever it is, you're like, yeah, all right, that makes sense. So what happens then, because they're better fitted to their environment, better suited to their environment. Eventually, they'll increase their numbers, okay, in that population. And then going back to the brown hairs versus the blonde hairs, they're that much more likely to pass on their characteristics to future generations than the other organisms, okay? So the environment is selecting because the environment controls who can live there follow. So that's where these environmental pressures are. And when those environments change, the organism may no longer thrive. That's another wrench into the works. And that's again where humans build air conditioners or heaters or hop into our Chevys and move. Populations of organisms don't necessarily have those choices. Here's the hardest one for everyone to get because the word, well, the word means exactly what we think it means. All right, bless you. You've been making 20 bucks an hour for the last five years. You got yourself a nice apartment. Uh, you got a, uh, a car payment. And you're used to eating at uh, Chipotle instead of Taco Bell now. And all of a sudden, the company up and moves and you're making 10 bucks an hour. What do you say? Well, I'm just gonna have to adapt. You're gonna make a change, you're gonna make a handful of changes, right? That's how we use the word adapt. That is not how they mean it in this situation. And I really wish 200 years ago they'd used another word. Because you have to be pre-adapted in order to adapt. It's not a decision these critters are making. They're either fit to or they're not fit to. Yeah. 
Yep, yep, that's for sure. That's for sure. All right. And people skills is something that is sort of predetermined. You're, you're right there. All right. But just want to make it sure that we're, we're talking about, you know, for the moment, we're going to talk about squirrels or, or a cactus. Okay. Um, if that environment all of a sudden becomes a wetland where that cactus has been, that cactus isn't going to be able to uh, pull up its roots, even though there's not a whole lot on cacti, and, and hop over 100 yards. It's going to die. And all those little cactus buddies around it are going to die. Now, let's say there's two cactuses on the fringes and 100 water lilies living all over the place. And this area starts to dry up. Now who's better suited to adapt to the new environment? And see, this is how they use the word adapt to the environment, because the environment is changing, but they were predetermined. It was already in their programming whether or not they could make it. So the water lilies are going to die out. The cactuses are going to grow in number. That's what's going on here. That's what they're talking about. And some of you are still saying, yeah, I don't know how that turns chimpanzees into people, though. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Just keep it simple. So it's a gradual process in which biological traits become more or less common in a population. It is a function of the effect of inherited traits on the differential reproductive successes. Well, that's a string of words, isn't it? Differential reproductive success of organisms interacting with their environments. I like the first bullet there a lot better than the second one. Um, what would a differential reproductive success be? Let's see, do we go there? We don't mention it again. Um, why do rabbits have like 12 babies? Why do frogs have 100 babies? You guys know? Well, there is, yeah, you go on the frog route there. Do they have multiple uteri as well? I'm wondering if they, cats have multiple uteri. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily going that biological, but but the, the life sucks and you get eaten, babies die route. Yeah, that's where I was going. And the, the frogs is even, and I thought you were going there. The frogs, they just scatter their sperm all over the place. It's kind of like a shotgun. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're hoping for the best there. But but the idea is, it, it, it's called attrition. Um, the idea is, is that you have way more babies than you could possibly support in the hopes that um, X number of them will stay alive. Yeah, a lot of predators. And in the case of the frogs, you got a slap shot of chance of getting, getting fertilized in the first place. Uh, but even then, they have a lot of tadpoles, way more tadpoles than could survive there. Um, so... Um, I, I guess I'm trying to explain the, the, the differential reproductive success is what I'm trying to talk about there. So. All right. So natural selection is a mechanism. Okay. And I, I think I've made that fairly clear. Um, but it's the environmental factors. Again, I think I've harped on that enough as well uh, that decide what can live where. The environment is in charge. And not to get on the soapbox again, but that's kind of why climate change is such a big deal. All right. Because the climate change, climate, a changing climate is a huge part of an environment. It's, it's, you know, a, a third of what an environment is, so to speak. Um, and if you want to talk about who's in charge, the environment's going to tell you what, what plants can live there, uh, what animals can live there. I'm, I'm sorry, not the environment, the, uh, the climate. Maybe I said climate. You know, the, uh, the temperature, the amount of humidity, the amount of moisture. Um, that's really what's in charge. So uh, it's a big factor, and it's a big thing. Again, questions. This is some fairly heavy stuff. 
that, again, I hope you guys are absorbing at least a little bit here, um, even if you're not to the level of, of questioning it yet. Um, please make sure you do. Think about it. All right. Uh, I am going to stop here because this is a fairly long conversation. I don't want to split into... Uh, couple different lectures. So this is a good breaking point. About 10 minutes early today, but 